Coming up on the Mobile Journalism Show. There are a handful of apps that are coming out that are really blowing me away and just in a very short period of time have made me get excited again in, uh, like I used to be about smartphone photography. Now I'm, I have things I can play with again. I can play with uh, rendered depth of field and lens effects that don't feel like effects. They feel like something that I've shot on a larger sensor with larger glass and that starts to open up all sorts of possibilities. There's never been a more exciting time to take photographs with your smartphone, but what does it mean for professionals and where are we heading? I'm joined by Dan Rubin, who is one of the pioneers on Instagram. Welcome to the Mobile Journalism Show. If you're a mobile journalist, marketer or creative who makes content on a mobile device or for mobile audiences, you're in the right place. Keeping you up to date with the fast moving world of mobile, Here's your host and mobile video specialist, Mark Egan. Right, so I'm in the very glamorous surroundings of uh, Terminal 1. Is Terminal 1 or Terminal 2? We're in, I think it's Terminal 1. We're in... Uh, it's Terminal 2. Um, okay, this, is, this podcast is only about four seconds old and it's already going horribly wrong. Um, but I'm with Dan Rubin um, and we've just been to Mojo Fest and I was just asking Dan, what's the best way to introduce you? And it got too, way too complicated, so I thought, let me just get him to do it himself. So Dan, who are you and what are you? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm properly a jack of all trades or, or a polymath. I think the latter sounds better. But uh, uh, professionally, I'm a photographer, creative director, designer, uh, and now um, music producer as well. But I do uh, a lot of different things that fall vaguely under a creative umbrella. Now, one of the first things I saw you do was um, uh, a video. I think it was on the Observer or Guardian website where you, know, you were going around on, I think it might have even been an iPhone 4 back in the day, taking photographs. And that was really strange in those days. Like somebody who's a photographer or taking, you know, doing serious things um, using a phone. Um, now talk about firstly, you know, how you start, first started using the phone for taking photographs and also the early days. It was all kind of connected to Instagram, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, the, I think that Guardian video was 2013. So that was probably at the introduction of the iPhone 5S. Uh, but the, yeah, it was a, it was a really kind of, important moment because it was clearly being taken very seriously, seriously enough that they were willing to put a video on their site. Um, I'd been shooting with smartphones since about the iPhone 4, which, which would have been before Instagram was introduced. I was just playing around with it. I shot some film and some uh, digital back then, but it was more on the hobby side uh, because I was running a creative agency at the time. And um, through all my design work, I got introduced to the founders of Instagram uh, as a beta tester before Instagram was released. So my, my design background led me to being a tester of this new app that had something to do with photography. And the minute I started playing with it, uh, it, was, it was just, it was something I wanted to use all the time. And uh, I wish that I'd, I'd, I'd been smart enough to in invest at that point because I just, for me, I knew this was something that I was just going to keep using as long as they kept making it. Uh, and clearly it's, it's become a really big thing. But back then there were probably 40 or 50 people using Instagram before it launched for a few months, which was, uh, which was pretty fun. So it's, it's all come a long way since then. Yeah, tell of, I mean, just specifically on Instagram, um, you were, I mean, you involved in there right at the beginning. Um, how was it then? How, you know, there must have been a point where suddenly you, were, you build a, a big following very quickly. Was that moment like, wow, you know, if you're interested in photography, this platform's incredible? Yeah, I think, um, well, I, I was pretty bullish on it from the very beginning. I remember telling a lot of people I knew who I knew were interested in photography. A lot of them were designers at the time, um, but uh, I was just telling people they should be on it and they should be using it. And if, if those people happen to be photographers, they kind of looked down their noses because they didn't take the smartphone seriously. And they, at, at, at the time of its introduction, you had to shoot within the app. So it was just a smartphone camera app. And so professional photographers just didn't even want to hear about it. But designers that I knew were really interested in it and started using it more and more. I just, I thought it was somewhere that people should be pretty much right away. Uh, both initially because it was fun, but it was just something that felt right. And within about the first year, the audience issue started to become a thing because there were so many people joining Instagram and signing up and following the handful of people early on that were recommended to you. So when you sign up, their, their onboarding process said, yeah, you should follow these six people. And there were about 20 people on that rotating list for the first year, and I was one of them. So I can't take responsibility for, uh, for my early kind of audience growth. That was just all happenstance of being in the right place at the right time. But it became very clear that there are a lot of people who are going to be seeing things that were shared. And I started to push photographers I know even harder. I said, you know, like, if, if you don't have your work on here, 
there are a lot of people who you don't know who won't be seeing it because the, the, your work is somewhere else. And that hasn't changed. I've kept being very, very bullish on that. And um, yeah, it's, it's now got to the point where I think everyone accepts that. So even if it's begrudgingly, every photographer knows that they have to be on Instagram because you've got uh, brands and agencies that are looking for commercial work and they're not looking for websites and portfolios first. They're browsing on Instagram because it's one place. They can look for styles of work and they can see it all on a level playing field. They don't care that it's small. They care that it's easy for them to access. And if you're not there, they're not going to find you. Now, in the early days, I remember you know shooting on you know, video cameras when they got smaller and then starting to shoot on the phone. And one of the worries you have is, do people take me seriously? Because, you know, I'm turning up and they're expecting to see something a bit more, you know, impressive and you whip out your phone. As a photographer, did you ever have that problem where people or you're working with a client or something and you shot something on a phone and people are like, you know, is this guy for real? Um, it was, I think more of it was in my head than anything else. Um, and I think that's the case for all of this. Is that, uh, uh, most people don't know. They might look at you funny, but if the output is what they want, they don't really care. And uh, most of the time, in my experience at least, clients won't question it. If they're really curious, they'll question it in a friendly way, but they're not saying, oh, don't use that. They're just saying, really? Are you, so you're, you're using your phone? And I did have a few instances of that, but it's because when I was doing uh, some of my earlier commercial shoots, I would shoot the work on a bigger camera and then I would shoot the same scenes on the iPhone because at the time anything that I would post to Instagram was just on an iPhone or a smartphone of some sort or another. I did the first five years of Instagram not uploading, refusing to upload film or big digital images because... Purist. Well, it was just, it was, it was the challenge for me that made it interesting and once I got used to that challenge, that that kind of changed things for me. But there were times where I would show up to, to a, you know, a less, you know, something I didn't have to shoot on a bigger camera, for instance. Like I did a, a red carpet shoot uh, at the Savoy uh, one year and it was meant to be shot on the phone. But you're standing there on the line with all of these other guys with their big cameras and uh, you've, well, you just feel a little insignificant. And, um, but again, that was in my head because what, what actually happened on that shoot was that I was more nimble. I could actually reach my arm in, in the middle of all these guys who were elbowing each other and get a shot that they couldn't because I had a camera that didn't weigh anything. So I could just hold it over my head and still see because I could see the screen or interacting with the celebrities that were walking down the, the red carpet. And they actually leaned in because they weren't used to someone asking to take a picture with a phone. So they went, really? Are you, are you just using, you know, um, uh, uh, I had at least three or four of the celebrities specifically say, are you, are you taking pictures? Like they just didn't know what was going on. They didn't talk to any of the other photographers or cameramen. So I, I, if anything, I found that the curiosity factor works the other way. And any of the fear of being judged is actually more in our heads than it is in anyone else. Now, since those early days, I think more people accept stuff shot on the phone can look really, really good. But you know, we just bumped into each other again at the airport here after being at Mojo Fest in Galway. And, um, you know, you're clearly buzzing about the state of, you know, smartphone photography and all the other kind of possibilities. Why? Why, if you, why at this point in time, 2018, are you thinking, actually, I'm excited again? Well, it, it, at this point, it's, the excitement for me is, is to do mostly with, um, with filmmaking. Because that's something that this year I'm I'm kind of slowly getting into after a long time of putting it off, and a lot of the work that I'm working on or things that I'm about to do with, when it comes to filmmaking, I'm I'm just going to be a director. I'm working with cinematographers that I know, and they're going to pick the equipment that we use. But I'm in that headspace, and I'm trying to think about how I can get better at understanding how to how to explain things to the to the DPs that I'm going to work with. And this week, there's just been so much talk about the advancements in, in what can be done on the smartphones. And because I've always focused mainly on smartphone photography in that realm, I just wasn't aware of it. I, I didn't know what happened in the last couple of years. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. And um, uh, it's kind of this new area for me to mine. But also on the, on the, the photography side, there are, there are new apps that are finally coming out to take advantage of things like dual camera setups that where you know Apple and other companies aren't really doing a ton yet computationally they're they're trying their best to capture 
a, a good image, but they're not pushing further than that. They're leaving that to app developers. And there are a handful of apps that are coming out that are really blowing me away, and just in a very short period of time have made me get excited again, in, uh, like I used to be, about smartphone photography, or rather than it being uh, a camera I always have with me, well, it just that just have, has been a normal thing the last three or four years. The the newness kind of faded away because I just got really good at doing it, and I didn't really need to think about it much. But it also wasn't something I could play with that much. I couldn't have fun with it because it just did what it was supposed to do. And now I'm, I have things I can play with again. I can play with uh, rendered depth of field and lens effects that don't feel like effects. They feel like something that I've shot on a larger sensor with larger glass. And that starts to open up all sorts of possibilities of our rendering, literally rendering, <laughs> and computationally rendering artistic intent. And that's new. So um, the, the, on this trip is a great example. I haven't brought any of my bigger digital cameras, which I might have usually had in my bag, even though I would be mostly shooting on a smartphone for an event like this. But now I don't feel like I have to, because if I feel like I want a shot, not just a portrait, but any kind of detail shot where I would normally take out a bigger camera and shoot wide open on a, on a 50 mil lens, I know I can get that on the phone computationally now, and that's, um, that's a pretty fantastic thing. And I mean, you were just showing me an app called Focus, F-O-C-O-S. Um, I mean, it's amazing because literally you take a picture and like you're saying, with you actually can change how blurry the background is. Change So actually, what was quite a bog standard picture suddenly looks really amazing. So Focus was one that you're playing. What, what other apps are you kind of using at the moment that you you would say to people, actually, it's worth checking these out? Well, on, on, on iOS, it's uh, I mean, Focus, yeah, is definitely, that's that makes me giddy still. I, I, I can't quite wrap my head around how good it looks and what it allows me to do because it allows depth map editing. It, it has all sorts of lens um, emulations, essentially, which is nuts, and you can build your own, and, and on and on and on feature-wise. So it's an editor as well as something you can shoot in. But... Um, I'm also a big fan of Darkroom, uh, again, iOS only, but it's a, it's a fantastic workflow-focused app. And, and by, by that, I mean it's just focused on speed. The idea is that you need to get in and out as quickly as possible. And it does all sorts of things, including allowing you access to curves and color channels. And uh, you can also do a certain amount of depth map-related uh, editing as well but more on, on, on the, the, the standard photo editor aspect of it. So you can edit where the plane of focus is and the depth of field, but you can, uh, you can do then different uh, visual effects to the foreground and background elements of, of the image. Uh, so it's, it, it, it kind of, uh, Darkroom kind of spans a, a pretty wide range of features. You can also save your own filters, which is really, uh, really good. So it's, again, for workflow, they've got batch processing and all sorts of things that you you would expect on a desktop app, but we haven't really seen to the extent and the attention to detail level that Darkroom's doing it uh, on a touch device. And um, that, there are loads of, loads of other little one-hit wonder kind of apps that are like Touch Retouch and Recrop that have been there for a very long time. And they're, uh, but they're, you know, they're, they do their job and it's nice to have them, but the things that apps like Focus and Darkroom and some others are pushing a, a ahead are what makes it fun again. Just finally, because I'm going to need to go through security or I miss my flight. Um, what's your, I know you could give probably a whole week of workshops on how to get better photos out of your smartphone. What is the stuff that you see people doing? They, they, they say, oh yeah, we can get great, great pictures out of this. They start shooting. So what's the kind of the main thing that you think, actually, if you could just take people for five minutes and explain this one thing to them, what thing do you think people are most getting wrong when it comes to getting the best out of their smartphone for photos? Oh God, the first thing is just clean your lens. Really, like the, the, our lenses get smudged. We have our hands in our pockets pulling our phones out or our bags or anything else. And the number of times where you can just tell that someone hasn't wiped their lens, we would do it on a bigger camera all the time. But even people who know better forget to do it on their phones. So honestly, it sounds like the dumbest thing, but that makes a huge difference in the clarity of your image. Uh, just wipe it on your shirt. It doesn't matter as long as it isn't a fingerprint, like a smudge on it. Um, at, at that point, afterwards, it's all about exposure and composition. As long as you're capturing a, a, a good base from which to edit, you can do everything else. Everything else will happen in post, whether that's editing the depth map or um, or editing the, the you know the colors and the curves and the brightness and saturation, everything else. 
um, you can't do a good edit unless you have a good starting point. So paying attention to where you're focusing, first of all, which even if you're using, I use the default camera app all the time, whether it's an iOS or Android, uh, because it's the fastest one to get into. So, uh, but I'm always tapping to focus. I want, I want to know where the camera's focusing. I don't want to trust that it's getting it right because it, I know better than it does. And after that, I'm focusing on the, the exposure. You know, it's really easy now on both platforms to be able to under or overexpose. So it's, why not do it? And after that, it's, it's the composition. But those are, those are the basics. If you get the composition right, you get the exposure right, you get the focus right, and your lens isn't smudged, then you're way ahead of, of most people. But those are the things that most people don't do. Well, it's been great talking to you. Sorry to bug you whilst you're sort of just relaxing in the airport. But um, I've got to go through that glorious thing that anybody involved in mobile journalism does when they go through the airport is the security where they always pick your bag, take it to the side and say, what is this shoulder pod thing? Um, but it's been great talking to you. Great to see you again. And um, I will continue to follow you on Instagram and look at all your pretty pictures that I wish I had the talent to take myself. But um, safe travels and hope to see you soon. Thanks, you too. If you like this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. And we'd love it if you would leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To get in touch with Mark, go to www.purplebridgemedia.com or tweet him at Mark Egan Video.